Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents George Arliss in The Man Who Played God with Florence Arliss and Dolores Costello. Lux presents Hollywood. Welcome to the Lux Radio Theater, the theater made possible by your loyal purchases of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap. In the hour to follow, you will be entertained by George Arliss, Florence Arliss, Dolores Costello, Elizabeth Risden, and Ivan Simpson. And acting on the air, Mr. Arliss' great screen triumph, The Man Who Played God, from the play by Jules Eckert Goodman, based on the story by Governor Morris. Our guest is the man Hollywood has just selected as the outstanding film director of the past year, Mr. Leo McCary, who, less than two weeks ago, received the Academy Award for his direction of The Awful Truth. Conducting our orchestra is Louis Silvers. This program is produced by one of Hollywood's most famous citizens and pioneers. Your host, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. One of the most flattering sensations in life is to be asked for advice. One immediately assumes a dignified thoughtfulness and prepares to blossom forth with opinions. But for me, the dispensing of advice is no longer the delight it once was. For I have a little ghost that haunts me, with an occasional reminder that I once advised George Arliss that I didn't think he'd have much of a chance in motion pictures. Long before Mr. Arliss became famous, he was acting at a combined dramatic school and theater at Margate, England. There he took notice of a girl who seemed to go out of her way to ignore him. One afternoon, to escape from a drenching downpour, Mr. Arliss dashed into the dark and empty theater and found that the young lady had preceded him. They looked at each other. They began to talk. And out of the rain and darkness, a kind of magic was distilled. At the end of four minutes, he'd proposed and the girl had accepted. George Arliss and Florence Montgomery have been married now for 39 years. Mr. Arliss' tremendous success in plays like the, like the Darling of the Gods, Disraeli, The Green Goddess, are theatrical history. The most successful of these, Disraeli, started off as a failure. In one large city, they knew Disraeli was a man, but couldn't remember whether he was in the Old Testament or the New. In another, when Mr. Arliss injured his arm, he played the role for more than ten weeks with his wrist in a sling. Greatly amused at overhearing people say, Why, I never knew that Disraeli had only one arm. To which someone usually answered, oh yes, Disraeli always carried his right arm in a sling. <laughs> Tonight, Mr. Arliss plays the role of Montgomery Royal in our adaptation of his brilliant Warner Brothers film, The Man Who Played God. Dolores Costello is featured as Grace Blair and Mrs. Arliss as Mildred Miller. You will also hear Elizabeth Risden as Florence and Ivan Simpson as Battle in the Lux Radio Theater production, The Man Who Played God, starring George Arliss. suite in Paris. The handsomely furnished rooms are the temporary quarters of Montgomery Royal, the famous American pianist. It's the afternoon of his last recital in France, and his sister Florence is feverishly sorting the day's mail. Battle, an elderly retainer who acts as a combined secretary and valet to the pianist, opens the doorway and stands there with a handful of mail. More mail, Miss Royal. More? All of this is getting out of hand, Battle. Yes, Miss. May I come in? <laughs> Mildred, of course. How are you, Florence? Good afternoon, Battle. Good afternoon, Mrs. Miller. Sit down, Mildred. I'm just trying to get through this mail. There seems to be a great deal of it. I suppose they are Monty's love letters. From adoring French women and hundreds of requests for seats for tonight's concert. Oh, what lovely roses. Are these from adoring French women also? No, Grace brought those. Grace Blair? Yes. Oh, an adoring American woman. Where is Monty? He ought to be resting. Resting? Did you ever know him to rest when he ought to? He's out walking with Grace. 
She called with those flowers, so he's taken her out to buy her a doll or something. A doll? You sure it wasn't a ring? Mildred, what are you talking about? Grace is only a child. A child of 25? I come to think of it, Grace must be nearly 25. Florence, don't you ever see anything that goes on under your nose? Don't you know she's in love with Monty? Oh, that's nothing. What about all these letters? But he doesn't give those people private music lessons. Mildred, I believe you're jealous. Yes, I believe I am. I wouldn't worry. Monty's too level-headed to fall for a sweet young thing at his age. Of course, you should have married Monty years ago if you'd had any sense. But I hadn't. Well, you're an eligible widow now. It's not too late yet. Florence, there's one very good reason why I haven't married Monty. And I needn't tell you what it is. He hasn't asked you? Well, perhaps he hasn't thought of it. Why don't you remind him? But they recognized you, Monty. Those girls we just passed. Nonsense, my dear. Is it? Well, they've turned around, and here they come. Quick, get in the hotel, Grace. Monsieur Hall, Monsieur Hall. Oh, Monsieur oh, Hall. Je vous ai reconnu tout de suite. Vous êtes le pianiste. Je vous ai entendu jouer beaucoup de fois. Je vous ai laissé une olive, n'est-ce pas, Monsieur? Oh, oui, yes. Votre musique oh, est si yeah. merveilleuse. Actually, Mon ami yeah. et moi, nous avons yeah. des livres pour uh, la signature. Yeah. Je vous en prie, Monsieur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuse me. Come on, Grace. Uh, through the lobby. No stopping. Why do you pretend you don't speak French, Monty? It, it saves answering questions. Look. There's Harold Van Allen waving to us. Hello, Harold. Hello, Marty. I'm coming to your concert tonight. May I take you, Grace? I'm going with Florence, thank you. Well, you can join the party, Harold. Uh, well, au revoir. Come on, Grace. The elevator's waiting. Monsieur Royal. Monsieur Royal. Oh, no. I'm again. Oh, Monsieur Royal. Je vous ai attendu pour vous saluer. Oui, oui. Je virai tant pour vous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Je vais vous applaudir ce soir, naturellement. Oh, yeah, yeah. Monsieur, vous êtes un artiste si merveilleux. Et je vous ai entendu si souvent que. Excuse me, je, uh, je ne comprends la, la, la French. Uh, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> oh, but I speak English too. Oh. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you remember me, do you not? I crossed on the Olympia with you in 1931. Madame Lavelle. Uh, Madame Lavelle. Oh, uh, yeah, yes, of course. Uh, uh, how, how do you do? Ah, oh, monsieur. It is easy to see the young lady is related to you. <laughs> I saw the likeness at once. Uh, really, yes. Uh, my granddaughter. <clears throat> Indeed. But I thought you were not married. No, no, I, I wasn't then. No, 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 not in 1931. But, but, but uh, I'm so glad you like her. Uh, come along, Grace, my dear. Going up. Oui, monsieur. Monty, why did you tell that woman I was your granddaughter? My dear Grace, you must give the public what they want. She wanted you to be my granddaughter. She didn't. She was just fishing. Besides, you know how terribly young you look. Yes, terribly is the word. <laughs> Mr. Royal. Hello, Battle. We Come in, Grace. We were wondering about you, sir. Thank you, Battle. Ah, Monty, here you are. Hello, my dear. We just had a nice, quiet stroll along the boulevard. Not a soul recognizes you. <laughs> Not more than 50 or 100. Hello, Monty. Mildred, dear. Nice to find you here. Just a flying visit. Good afternoon, Miss Blair. Good afternoon, Mrs. Miller. Grace, you know, is my protege. All great musicians must have a protege. So I thought I might as well have a good look out. You also have a sister who's been working her fingers to the bone. Ah, but look how I have to work mine on the bones tonight. Smiting the ivories, hip and thigh. <laughs> well, good luck to you tonight, Monty. Oh, don't go yet, Mildred. I need your advice, as usual. Well, what is it? I want you to see this drawing that's come from the architect. Ah, yes, here it is. Don't you think that's a lovely setting for a church organ? There's the inscription. To the glory of God and the memory of Margaret Ruth Royal. To the memory of your mother. I'm going to have it built in the little church in New York that she always attended. What do you think of it? It's beautiful. Good. You know, she was always conscious of the vibrations of the church organ, in spite of her deafness. You remember, Florence, how it affected her? We used to often see the tears come into her eyes. I didn't know your mother was deaf. Yes, quite early in life. It's a family inheritance. Her father and his father before him. A terrible inheritance. I think she'd like my giving this organ to the church. I beg your pardon, sir. I think you ought to rest. One moment. I've got something rather exciting to tell you all. It's about a king. King? You know, I was going home a week ago when I suddenly decided to give this concert. Yes? Well, that was because I was commanded to give it by a real live king. Nobody can command you. You're a king yourself. Well, then he approached me as one king to another and asked me to give one more concert that he might attend incognito. But why must he come in secret? I'm not sure. 
But I've heard that there have been some recent attempts on his life. Heavens, Monty, I hope nothing will happen at the concert. There's an unfeeling woman for you. A king's life in danger, and all she thinks of is the incidental music. <laughs> well, I really must go. I'll see you tonight, Monty. Come back to my dressing room after the concert. Very well. Let me see you to the door. Goodbye. Until this evening. Oh, Grace. What are you looking so solemn about? You'd better say goodbye to me, too. I won't see you again. Yes, you will. I'm not going till tomorrow. But I won't see you alone. Oh, well, there may be a king or two present, but... Don't make fun of me, Monty. I won't be able to follow you to New York for a month. Won't you? Well, mind you, practice five hours a day. I can learn more from you in five minutes than from anyone else in five years. You love music, don't you? I love you. Monty, I love you. Grace, Grace, my dear child. I'm not a child. Don't be foolish. I'm old old enough to be your... You know I'm your grandfather. I don't care how old you are. I love you. No, dear, you don't. You love music. You love the successful pianist, not me. Paris has got into your blood. Everybody gets romantic in Paris. But I'm not just romantic, Monty. I'm in earnest. Wait till you get back to New York. You'll feel quite different. Will you try me? Try you? If I come to you in six months and say I love you, will you marry me? Well, but... uh, Oh, don't you love me at all? Of course I love you. But I'm old and easily flattered. How can I help loving you? Then you will? What? If I come to you in six months, you'll marry me? If you look at me with those beautiful eyes, I may not be able to resist you. Don't beat about the bush. Say yes. But uh, Say yes. Yes. Oh, Monty, darling. This way, madame. The seat going for. What a crowd. Isn't it marvelous? Do you see anybody who looks like a geese? Our four seats aren't together. Harold, will you take care of Grace? With pleasure. No, I'll sit with you, Florence. Oh, no, you won't. You young people will sit together. You come with me, Mildred. Well, we uh, might as well sit down, Grace. May I take your wrap? Thank you, Harold. Oh, I believe I'm excited. You seem to be. After Mr. Royal sails tomorrow, I suppose I may have a chance to see something of you. What do you mean? You're always seeing me. I'm always calling to see you, but you're generally otherwise engaged. Harold, don't start that again. I want to listen to the music. Well, uh, there isn't any music yet. Why do you carry those enormous race glasses? I like to watch the movement of his fingers. There he is. Who, the king? No. What an ovation. Madame, Mr. Royal never sees anyone. Uh, shut the door, Battle. Don't let anyone in. Yes, sir. Monty! Oh, come in quickly. Monty, you are marvelous tonight. Thank you, Grace. How did the king enjoy it? The king, dear lady, didn't turn up. Court manners, I suppose. Then Mr. King really missed something. I've never heard you so inspired. Mildred, that's my very nicest compliment. Thank you. Monty, there are at least a hundred autograph books for you to sign. Let Battle do it. His handwriting is so much better than mine. And then get behind that piano battle and shoot anyone who calls me maestro. Monsieur Royal? Yes? His Majesty the King. Your Majesty. Maestro. Uh, never mind, Battle. Uh, excuse me, Your Majesty. I hope you will forgive me. Uh, your Majesty was busy. Busy? Uh, my aide can tell you how busy. His Majesty's car broke down, monsieur. It was unavoidable. I am overwhelmed with shame. And I would have given my ears to have heard you play once again the Moonlight Sonata. Would you? Well, if your majesty will lend me your ears, you shall hear it now. That is generous of you. Will you be seated, your majesty? Uh, Thank you. Thank you.
Your Majesty, a bomb. Come on, please, George. Stand back, everybody. Get away from that window. Quick, look out. Thank God there was nobody below. Your Majesty, are you all right? Yes, yes, but Monsieur Royal, he is unhurt, Your Majesty. He saved my life. Monsieur Royal. Monsieur, I owe my life to you. How can I ever thank you? Your Majesty will forgive me, but I can't hear what you're saying. What? Monsieur Royal. Monty, what is it? There's no sound. Nothing. Monty, what are you saying? It's the shock. I shall never play again. Don't say that. Don't look like that. Mildred, my dear, I'm stone deaf, just as my mother was. the first act of The Man Who Played God. And in a moment, George Arliss and our co-stars will be back in Act Two. But during our brief intermission, we'd like you to come along with us to an amusing place where everybody speaks in rhyme. Even the judges, the lawyers, and prisoners in the courts of law. We take you to a courtroom in this strange land of rhyme right now. Here we are, in the presence of a jury and a defendant. And the judge is about to enter. Court will come to order. The judge is coming in. Bring the prisoner to the bar. Young woman, what's your sin? Your Honor, I don't think it's bad, but goodness, I am blue. My husband gets so angry, and so I've come to you. This court is here to listen to crimes against society. My husband says my hands are a crime against propriety. He says they look so wrinkled and so old and rough and red because I wash the dishes. That's not half of what he said. Now let's take up the problem. You wash dishes every day? Oh, why not eat on paper plates, then throw them far away? Why, that's all right for picnics or a quick informal bite. But when dishes are attractive, to keep them too inactive? Well, of course I really might. But do you think it would be right to keep them out of sight? Hmm, that's a sticker. Now let's see. Rough hands spoil tater tates. Suppose you have your dinner and uh, just not wash the plate. Your Honor, I'm a housewife. My home is always clean. I wouldn't dream of such a thing. Oh, all you men are mean. Now, don't speak like that to me, my dear. I'm sorry. Ah, now listen here. I've now got information on the cause of your mistakes. I put you on probation to wash dishes with Lux Flakes. Every wife of every station can now avoid heartaches, keep hands from ruination by using mild Lux Flakes. His honor is right. To keep your hands white, get Lux Flakes tonight. <laughs> you see, this rhyming business is contagious, but so is the use of Lux Flakes for dishes. Women who try it are so delighted with it that they tell other women. You, too, will find Lux not only makes dishwashing quicker and easier, but keeps your hands lovely, soft, and white. The kind of hands men admire, the kind that every woman wants to have. Use Lux Flakes for dishes. And now, Mr. DeMille. The man who played God... Starring George Arliss with Florence Arliss and Dolores Costello. Five long months have passed. And Monte has, has learned that his case is hopeless. That he will never hear again. Embittered, he shuts himself away from the world, seeing only three people. His sister and Grace and the man who instructs him in lip reading. In his New York City penthouse, high above Central Park, He's receiving his final lesson from the instructor. And now, Mr. Royal, I'm going to give you the final test. Yes? I'm going to place my fingers almost over my lips and see if you can read what I say. Go on. From that window, I can see the people walking in Central Park. What did I say? From that window, I can see the people walking in Central Park. Good. How did you get that? Mainly from the muscles of your throat and jaw. Well done. Try again. The flowers are blooming, the sun is shining, and God's in his heaven. The flowers well, are blooming, the sun is shining, and God's in his heaven. Splendid. 
Well, you're a remarkable student, Mr. Royal. Thank you. I'm afraid there's no use of my coming anymore. I shall be sorry to lose you. Impress on your friends not to try to help you by mouthing their words. They'll only mislead you. I don't allow many visitors. <laughs> no? You should. Goodbye. Oh, uh, Mr. Royal. <laughs> try not to be irritable. And don't try to fight against fate. Ah, you're not a musician. No, I'm a philosopher. Goodbye. What's the use of it? Words, yes. But no music. No music. Monty. Oh, it's you, Florence. Why don't you come straight in instead of creeping up behind me and pushing me? I'm so sorry. You and Battle are always talking behind my back. Why can't I be left alone? I know perfectly well I'm a millstone around your neck, but you needn't make me conscious of it every moment. Monty. Oh. Grace come yet? No, but Mildred is here. You wish to see her? No. Uh, yes. I should like to see Mildred. Come in, dear. Monty. Well, Mildred... This is my den. <laughs> the lion's den, you know. Clarence. Sit down. How do I speak to him to make him understand? Do I speak loud or slow or how? Speak naturally, that's all. I can understand you. You heard what I said? No. <laughs> I didn't hear. I read your lips. Read my lips? How wonderful. Oh, Monty. Why are you crying? Because you find me changed, eh? Haven't I good reason to be changed? But I'm glad you've come. I've missed you. I've often wished to talk to you during these five silent months. You didn't answer my letters. I knew you only wrote because you were sorry for me. You should know me better than that, Monty. But I can talk to you. You've always... Mildred, do you believe in God? Yes. I've been studying the Bible lately. Listen. It says here... Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Do you believe that? Yes. If he knows everything, why does he let such horrible things happen? Monty. You only left me my music. Mildred, I've withdrawn my promise for the church organ. Why? Because I won't be a hypocrite. He struck at me. He struck at my mother. Why should I glorify his name? Perhaps someday you'll learn why. I can't believe that he makes mistakes. Mildred, the Bible is a great book, but I'll tell you what it has taught me. You there who is no to... God. You who were so tender, so good. There is no God. You shut yourself up here and brood on your affliction. Do you know where this will lead you? Yes, to madness. I thought of that and how easy it would be to end it all. I've thought of that, too. Don't say those things. Monty... You've never had to test yourself before. Test myself? I'm not speaking of music. I'm speaking of life. You've had everything. Wealth, talent, social position. But you've never really suffered. A man who has never suffered has never lived. This is not suffering. <laughs> this is a living death. It's your first great test. Are you going to fail? Are you? Hello. Oh, Mrs. Miller. Good afternoon, Grace. I'm so glad to see you. What do you think of Monty? Stop that. I won't have anybody ask what they think of me. I know what they think of me. <laughs> He's a bad child sometimes. Sit down, Mrs. Miller. I was just going, Grace. Oh, don't let me turn you out. He sees too much of me, you know. But I must go. Goodbye, Monty. Goodbye. Thank you for coming. How are you today, Monty? Why do you say I see too much of you? You know I look forward to your coming. Monty, you make it very hard for me to say goodbye. Goodbye. You knew I was going to Santa Barbara, to the Chittenden's. I'm leaving tonight. But I thought you were leaving tomorrow, Wednesday. Today's Wednesday, dear. Oh, is it? <laughs> well, one day's so much like another to me. Well, I've lost a day, that's some consolation. <laughs> I feel terribly about leaving you. If I hadn't promised... Oh, of course you must go. You need a change. Why should I need a change? Too much of me. I'm beginning to tell on you. Monte. Why are you carrying those field glasses? Are you going to the races? <laughs> no, not exactly. Mother and I are... 
Oh, Monty, you know how I love the piano. We were going to the concert this afternoon. Do you mind? Mine? It's the first recital I've been to since... since yours. Does it seem rather heartless for me to go? Oh, why shouldn't you? You are taking these glasses to watch the fingering. I remember. You used to watch mine. Yes, I always watched yours. Oh, I don't think I can bear it. I won't take them. Nonsense. Why not? Anyone else going with you? No. Oh, yes, I think Harold Van Allen is going to be there. Oh. A nice young fellow, you think so? Harold? He's all right. Well, I won't keep you. Have a nice holiday in Santa Barbara. I quite envy you. Why don't you come? No, thank you. I might read their lips too freely and find out what they say about me. No, thank you. I suppose there'll be crowd. Oh, just old friends, I expect. Van Allen's an old friend of theirs, isn't he? Yes, I, I believe he is. Suppose he'll be there. Harold, I shouldn't be surprised. Grace, you know, if you turn your head away, I can't tell what you're saying. Will Harold Van Allen be there? Yes. Monty, do you remember what I said that day in Paris? I meant it, Monty. I mean it now. I know. Goodbye, my dear. Enjoy yourself. I'll see you the moment I come back. Goodbye. Goodbye. away from the window, sir. I'm afraid you'll catch cold. Eh? You'll catch cold with the window open, sir. I was looking down into the street. There's a fascination about height battle. I don't wonder at people giving way to sudden impulse. Mr. Royal. What's the matter? Nothing, sir. I was about to suggest, oh, Mr. Royal, if you'd only try to play again. It's so long since you've touched the piano and your violin. Play again. I wonder if I could. Sit down, sir. Try it again just once. If I touch these keys, there'll be music in this room. Music. I can't do it. I can't. To strike the notes and hear no sound. Ghostly. Terrifying. Battle. Have these things taken away. And my violin, I can't bear the sight of them. Mr. Royal, if Don't only... argue with me. You want to drive me mad? Don't you know that these things are human to me? And they are mocking me, mocking me. Get this piano out of the house. And this, my violin. We played together, you and I. Well, we'll never play again. Mr. Royal. That was foolish of me. Why did I do that? My violin. My old friend. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. I've taken your life. I've taken your... That all? Yes, Mr. Royal. I want to be left alone. Alone, sir? Yes. Alone. Go. Yes. Yes. No sound, no voices, nothing but silence, forever, the silence of the tomb. The silence of the tomb. Mr. Royal! Mr. Royal, come down from that window, sir. Oh, for God's sake. Why did you stop me? I have nothing to live for. You have everything to live for. Tell me one thing. One reason why I should live. For others. For those who love you. I'm a burden to those that love me. That's not true. You think I'm blind as well as deaf? Don't I see you all groaning and suffering for me? Because you suffer too. We try to help you. Can you give me my music? No. Nobody can do that. But there are other things. You are thinking only of yourself. It's cowardly of you, that's what it is. You're a man, and you're supposed to have a man's strength. You ought to set an example of courage to other deaf people, not turn tail and sneak out of the world. You're a coward, a beastly coward. A coward? Mr. Royal, forgive me. 
a coward. <laughs> and I thought it took a great deal of courage to do what I was about to do. But you're right. It's easier to die than to live. Don't ever try to do that again. There's so much beauty in the world. And so much that is ugly and brutal. The trees and the flowers in the park. Look at them, sir. Nature's beautiful. But his workings are cruel. I see no guiding hand, no method, no meaning. Here, look through these field glasses, sir. The flowers. You can almost count the petals through these. Uh, look, sir. Look. Yes. Trees and flowers and cripples and beggars. Hunger and strife and flowers in hopeless confusion. <laughs> How absurd to believe in a merciful God. But there's joy and happiness, too. You can't have just one thing. It's contrast that makes life so wonderful. Yeah. Uh, sickness, too. There's a young fellow walking down there. Looks as though he hasn't long to live. The girl's got hold of his arm. These are very strong glasses. Very strong lenses. I can read their lips. What are they saying, sir? You want me to be an eavesdropper, Battle? I want you to see and understand the misfortunes of others. Troubles that are worse than your own, sir. He's sitting on the bench. He's telling her that the, what the doctor has just told him. He has to go away. A long rest. There's no money. The girl holds his hand. She's crying a little. It'll cost at least a thousand dollars. There's your god of contrast, Battle. This boy's going to die, die like a neglected dog because he hasn't a thousand dollars. <laughs> it's a wonderful world for some people. It would be for him, sir, if only... Oh, if, if, if only he had the money, if he had a thousand dollars, if he had... Belto. Yes, sir. I want you to take a note down of that boy and girl. Take a note, sir. <laughs> Sit down and write it. Yes, sir. Ready, sir. If you'll give the bearer your name and address, if you will give the bearer your name. I can't figure it any other way, darling. I need a thousand. There's no chance of getting it. I guess that's all. No, no, I won't let you say that. There must be a way. There must be. I don't see how. We can't get married. I guess we never will now. Oh, Ed. It's tough on you, honey. Tougher on you than on me. Don't say anything. Don't speak, Ed. What is it, honey? I'm praying, Ed. Praying to God. Maybe I won't be hurt. Honey. Shh. I'm praying to him now. Dear God. Honey, don't. It's you... no use. Just the way things are. He can't help us. I beg your pardon? Yeah? What is it? I have a note for him. For me? Yes. But you... You don't know who I am. Will you read it, please? What does it say? If you will give the bearer your name and address, the person who has overheard your conversation will take pleasure in sending you the thousand dollars. <laughs> but how could anyone have overheard? There was nobody around here. There couldn't have been. Who wrote this? I am not at liberty to say. Will you write your address here, please? Uh, sh shall I? Yes. But I... I want to know who did this. Who sent that note? Shall we say it was a man who, for the moment, played God? Good luck to you, sir. Ed! A thousand dollars! Who did it? Who? Ed. I prayed to God, and he heard me. He heard me. Oh, <laughs> She prayed for it. She prayed for help, and she thinks that God, God, <laughs> at last they've got a good joke on him. Ah, uh, I wonder. 
has he the laugh on me. Because for station identification, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain falls on the second act of The Man Who Played God. And following this short intermission, George Arliss continues in Act Three. The awards of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences are given each year for outstanding achievement in acting, directing, writing, photography, and the many other arts and sciences that enter the making of a film. A few days ago, the gold statue proclaiming him the outstanding director of 1937 went to Mr. Leo McCary director of Columbia Studios' exquisite comedy, The Awful Truth. Mr. McCary's genius for comedy is mixed with a rare appreciation of pathos and drama. For after directing Eddie Cantor, Harold Lloyd, Laurel and Hardy, and the Marx Brothers, Leo turned round and gave us Ruggles of Red Gap. And more recently, that, that tear-stained documents of, of parents and children make way for tomorrow. Welcome, Leo, and Congratulations. All great directors like to talk, Leo, so begin. I'd rather hear the third act of Mr. Harless play. <laughs> yeah, but in the meantime, we want to know something about you. How did you get your start in film? Well, C.B., to tell you the truth, when I started directing, I tried to pattern myself after you. I'll never forget the first big mob scene. The crowd made me nervous, but I, tried, but I decided to handle them with a firm hand, like you would do it, Mr. DeMille. The scene was supposed to be the San Francisco earthquake. Oh, excuse me, Leo, but San Francisco people refer to it as the fire. Well, I'm from Los Angeles. <laughs> the scene was the San Francisco earthquake. I climbed the platform and started explaining the scene to the crowd. On the first signal, I said, I want the crowd to rush in from out of the buildings, on the, uh, from the buildings on the left. As I said this, a little fellow raised his hand far in the rear. Don't interrupt me, I said. Kindly wait until I've finished. I'm sure that's the way you would have handled it, Mr. DeMille. Mm, yes, that's probably the way I'd have handled it. Now, then I continued. On the second signal, I want another crowd to run in from the right. And again, the little man raised his hand. Quiet, I ordered. I asked you to wait until I was through. I'm sure that's the way you would have handled it, Mr. DeMille. Hmm. Now I had absolute quiet. I was the master of the situation, and I felt it. I, com I completed my instructions and sent for the little man. Now, what is it that you wanted to say that could possibly be more important than what I wanted to say to 350 people? He looked me over from my helmet to my puttees and replied, I only wanted to tell you that we couldn't hear a thing back there. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have handled that with a megaphone. Well, that's what I thought, so I got one. But, but I'll be darned if the same little man didn't raise his hand again. Completely out of patience, I asked, what is the matter now? He says, well, I was in San Francisco at the time of the earthquake. It happened to be five o'clock in the morning, and don't you feel that most of us would be wearing nightgowns? <laughs> and I call lunch. <laughs> I'm positive that's the way you would have handled it, Mr. DeVille. <laughs> oh, thank you, Leo. Lunch has saved many a delicate situation. Now for the awful truth. Directing that picture must have been almost as much fun as seeing it. Well, it didn't start out as smoothly as you might imagine. No? No, I'm sure Irene Dunn would have been happier if the starting date had been postponed. Uh, Cary Grant arrived on the set with his manager and suggested that his part either be built up or cut out. Even an extra man came to me and said, I just read the script, Mr. McCary, and if you don't mind, keep me in the background, will you? <laughs> <laughs> but, but that dog you had in the picture, that clever, wire-haired terrier... You mean Mr. Smith? Yes, at least he was your friend, wasn't he? He didn't complain about his part. Well, he didn't say anything. <laughs> he bit me. <laughs> <laughs> but don't get the impression that the cast was wrong, because as a matter of fact, they were very right. I sent out a hurried call for the writer, Vina Delmar... And all during the making of the picture, she worked day and night developing the story. Many of the suggestions we used came from Irene Dunn and Cary Grant, and uh, I mustn't forget Ralph Bellamy. And the only thing that would make me happier would be if I could make another picture written by Venia Del Mar with the same three stars. Well, you've given us some highly hilarious scenes, Leo. 
In your own opinion, which is the most memorable in your career? Well, the scene that stands out in my memory was anything but humorous, C.B. It was the Ruggle, uh, it was Ruggles of Red Gap and the scene in which Charles Lawton recites uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Mm, it's still referred to as one of the finest moments on the screen. And you deserve a world of credit. No, I don't think so. Why not? Well, you see, Mr. Lincoln wrote it, and Mr. Lawton spoke it. I just enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> now, during 20 years in Pictures, Leo, you must have acquired some peculiar habits or superstitions that might be very interesting. Oh, yes, C.B., I do have a superstition, uh, just one, and it's terrible. I can't seem to overcome it. Well, what is it? Well, I'm superstitious about making bad pictures. I just sort of feel they don't do anyone any good. <laughs> so long, C.B., and congratulations on your fine program and your excellent product. Uh, you make a pretty good product, too. <laughs> the curtain rises on Act Three of The Man Who Played God with George Arliss, Florence Alice, and Dolores Costello. In the loneliness of his room, high above the park, Monty has made his peace with God by reading the lips of those less fortunate and giving them aid. It's a few weeks before Christmas, and Monty kneels in the center of the room unpacking a crate of toys, singing as he works. Battle enters and stands beside him. Cha-dee-da, cha-dee. How are you all, Bethlex? Getting ready for Christmas, sir. <laughs> well, what if I am? Cha-dee-da. Singing, too. Was I? Well, I never had any voice, you know, and I always wished I could sing like Caruso, and now I can. Can you, sir? In my own estimation, uh, yes. I sing and I can't hear a sound, so I imagine I'm singing like Caruso. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great thing sometimes not to be able to hear. Ah. Uh, well, were the children in the park pleased with the toys I sent them? And you watch them through the glass? <laughs> it's rather a lark, isn't it, Battle? It's a great work you're doing, sir. Oh, no, not great. Just a lark. But I've got a grand idea. I'm going out. Going out? Yes. I thought it all over. I'm not going to be a hermit anymore. Shall I get your hat, sir? No, no, not now. Christmas. Christmas? You see, Miss Grace is coming back. Is she, sir? I'm glad. Yes. Seems too good to be true. Well, at Christmas... I'm going with her into all sorts of toy shops. And I'm going to watch the children and find out just what they want. I shall be on the inside of the shop, you see. And they'll be outside looking through the window. And I can read their lips. And then you take the toys out of them. It's a good idea, Battle? It's a beautiful idea. A beautiful work, sir. Nonsense. The work will be yours, you see. You'll have to carry the toys. <laughs> Don't go, don't go yet. Sit down, sit down, Mildred. Here, let me make you comfortable. Why, I believe you're really glad to see me. I am. But you're so changed. What's happened to you, Mark? I'm living again, Mildred. And I'm having the time of my life. Grace comes home today, doesn't she? Yes. You know, Mildred, I used to think I could only bring her misery, but now I'm, now I'm very happy. What has changed you, Monty? These. Those field glasses? Yes. I've learned things up here with the stars. Things that I never dreamed of. What things? The doubts and fears are only shadows. For long months I shut my eyes. And in the darkness I railed against God. I cursed and hated and cried out in defiance. And when my hatred was most bitter, he answered and sent me these. You look up there and read the stars. No. I look down there in the park, and read their lips. I hear the despairing cry of those who suffer and doubt, as I suffered and doubted. And you, you answer their call? Yes, I take a hand. You see, I'm so close to God up here that he's taken me into partnership. <laughs> Come out here, Mildred, and see my roof garden. See down there, those people in the park? They were only strangers to me once. Shadows I passed and never noticed. But I'm close to them now. I know their hopes and their fears, their happiness and their misery. They need comfort and help. And you give it to them. Well, I do what I can. It's little enough. Monty, there's something sublime about this. Only business of its kind on earth? Absolute monopoly. It's been your salvation. My salvation. Through God. It was he who did it, Mildred. 
Now, you must excuse me a moment. I must see if there are any more customers down there. <laughs> These glasses are remarkable. I never get over the one rock. Ah, here's a young couple coming round the park. The park's a great place for lovemaking, you know. Mildred. Yes? Who do you think it is? Someone you know. Grace. Grace, looking like one of the flowers. And young Van Allen with her. Grace and Harold, let me look. Wait a minute. What a stunning frock she has on. And the very latest thing in hat. Can I tell you what she's saying? Monty, give me those glasses. Don't snatch. Be careful of them. Don't spy upon her. Talk to me until she comes in. Spy upon her? What do you mean? Nothing. You're frightened. What is it? I told you. Nothing. Well, it seems like looking through the keyhole. Mildred, I don't hear gossip, you know. Has there been any? Don't talk nonsense. Give me those glasses. If there's anything I should know, it's better to learn it this way. Monty! I'm going to read their lips. It's for her sake, too, you know. Sit down, Grace, just for a moment. I can't, Harold. But I've got to speak to you. I've got to. When I said goodbye at Santa Barbara, I told you that was the end. Why do you follow me to his door? Because I know that when once you enter that house, you're lost to me. I flung myself at him when he was well and famous. I can't desert him now. You've no right to gamble your whole life away just because of one rash promise. It's no use, Harold. I can't leave him like this. I can't. But you're leaving me, and you love me. You do love me. You know I do. Well, then don't ruin our happiness just because you're sorry for him. Go and tell him you've changed your mind. Harold, I'm going through with it. He's been cheated of so much, I'm not going to cheat him now. He's put his faith in me, and I won't be a quitter. Grace. Grace, dear, I I won't argue anymore. But don't leave me yet. Sit here with me, please. Just for a little while. I wasn't sure, but you see, they're both young, and I was afraid. Yes, and they're both young. I've been very foolish, but she was always so, so dear to me. Does it hurt terribly? It hurts terribly. I'd better go. She'll be coming up here. Yes. I wonder what God would do in a case like this. And then we had a barbecue dinner, and I cooked the steaks. Monty, you're not interested. Of course I am, Grace. You've hardly said two words to me since I came. You just sit and look at me. What is it, Monty? I have to look at you to understand you, to read your lips. What did you do while I was away? Nothing. Everything. Lawrence tells me you changed your mind about the organ. You gave it to the church after all. Yes. Monty, what's the matter? Aren't you glad I've come back? Yes. You haven't told me so. Perhaps I was waiting to see if you had anything to tell me. But I've been trying to tell you. I mean, about Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. Oh, there's nothing to tell about that. The usual round. Nice people there? Hmm? Anybody we know? Mainly their Western friends. And, oh, yes, Harold Van Allen, of course. Yes, of course. But let's talk about ourselves. You know you haven't even kissed me. That's better. Monty. What? You made a compact with me. I've come to hold you to your promise. Must you, Grace? Monty. Our compact was made six months ago. It's a long time. But I gave you my word. I mean, you gave me your word. I'd like to break my word. Monty, why? Because you have such a beautiful nature that I don't want to lose you as a friend. I don't know what you mean. Something has happened to change me. When? Today. What is it? Who is it? You. Me? But but how? Do you remember these? 
My field glasses? You remember you left them behind. Well, they turned out to be fairy glasses. By looking through them, by looking at people in the park, I can see everybody's life just as it is. Everybody's thoughts just as they are. Monty. Don't be frightened. I saw you in the park, please. You... You read our lips. Yes. Yeah. Puts me in a pretty bad light, doesn't it? Eavesdropping. But you see, I wasn't quite prepared for what I was to hear. Monty, you don't think I've been deceiving you, do you? No, dear. You've just been deceiving yourself. I did love you. I do love you. Grace, since I've been living up here, close to the sky, I've learned many things. Things that hurt me, but left me spiritually better. It was music that brought us together. You know that, don't you? Yes. It was a love founded on perfect harmony, but we never looked ahead. Our love was music. But you see, dear, a string snapped, and the music ceased. Not altogether, Monty. You'll always be my idol. I shall always be your friend. Goodbye. You behave like a gentleman, Grace, and perhaps I admire you more than I could ever have loved you. Monty. Goodbye, my dear. I'm beginning to be worried, Mrs. Miller. He said he was going for a walk in the park among his customers, as he calls them. But I expected him back. Do you think he might have gone to look at the organ? He might. He's often said he meant to sneak in one day. Thank you, Bethel. I'll go to the church. Oh, God, send him peace. Send him happiness. Give him strength. It's Monty. Monty! Mildred. I'm so glad... I... I came to see the organ. I did, too. And to pray for something, Monty. What? That you might be the first to touch the keys, to play upon it. No. No, I can't. I couldn't stand it. It's there, Monty, in the loft. May I go up with you? An organ. Grand. The last time you played, it was for a king. This inscription says, to the glory of God. Won't you play for a king again? Sit beside me, Mildred. Don't leave me, please. Won't you play? Yes. For the king. Man who played God. We'll hear again from Mr. Alice in a moment. A while back, there was a wave of interest, you all remember, on the subject of child marriages. The question arose, what is actually the age of the average bride in this country? Melville Ruick has an answer for you. Here are figures based on 60,000 marriages in a large eastern state. The average age of marriage for girls was 22. 65% of the brides were under 25. Of course, these figures don't tell the whole story. For as everybody knows... Women who are truly charming can marry at almost any age. Charm counts a lot more to a man than how old a woman is, how well-educated, or how much money she spends on herself. For example, no man knows how much a woman's dress costs. He does know if it's becoming and dainty and charmingly feminine. 
Undoubtedly, that's why charming women the world over are Lux users. For Lux flakes are made to keep your frocks just that way, to keep the colors and the fabric fresh and new looking. You can count on these gentle flakes to care for anything that's safe in water alone and to keep it beautiful an extra long time. To guard charm, use Lux flakes. Now, our producer. Our debt to Mr. Ellis extends beyond his superb performance. He expected to leave for Hollywood this week to return abroad, but altered his plans in order to be with us tonight. I'm sure, Mr. Alice, that I speak for all your listeners in wishing you and Mrs. Alice bon voyage. Very kind of you. Thank you, Mr. Mill. The uh, broadcast of Disraeli on this stage uh, brought me a large number of very charming letters, very many from middle-aged and elderly people to whom it recalled pleasant associations of their earlier life about 25 years since I uh, first played it. My wife and I were very gratified to find that the broadcast was able to bear comparison with the stage production. I had one letter of a more personal character from a very young lady who said that her mother didn't care for her to go to the theater, but she always allowed her to see my pictures because I was married to Mrs. Alice. <laughs> uh, of all the response... Uh, from the film version of The Man Who Played God, the most satisfying was from a group of deaf people who, for the first time, learned from the picture of lip reading. They studied it, and they wrote to me and said uh, that it opened to them a new and happy life. If our play tonight has given you entertainment, I shall feel very happy. If it has brought to you something a little beyond mere entertainment, I shall feel Still more gratifying. Good night. Good night, Mr. Alice. There's wonderful news of next week's stars and play coming to you in just a moment from Mr. DeMille. But first, may I say that in our cast tonight were Ivan Simpson as Battle, Elizabeth Risden as Florence Royal, Leonard Willey as Mr. Appleby, Evelyn Keyes as Girl in the Park, Reginald Sheffield as Boy in the Park, Vernon Steele as the King, Frank Nelson as Harold, Michelette Birani as Madame Louvelle, Charles Evans as Usher, Louis Merrill as a manager, James Eagles as aide to King, Edith Nestier and Lou Lorraine as French girls, and Elizabeth Wilbur and Georgia Kane. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he directed music for their new picture, Sally, Irene, and Mary. And now, here's Mr. DeMille. A week from tonight, the Lux Radio Theatre will echo to the unforgettable melodies of Victor Herbert. Sweet mystery of life, falling in love, and Italian street song, all of which tells you that our play will be that tremendous success of stage and screen, Naughty Marietta. Making special trips from New York to be with us are two of the greatest and most popular singers heard today in grand opera, motion pictures, and on the air. Mr. Lawrence Tibbet and Miss Helen Jepson. Naughty Marietta is a dramatic play of old New Orleans. Miss Jepson will be heard as the runaway French countess and Mr. Tibbet as the reckless American soldier. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Lawrence Tibbet and Helen Jepson in Victor Herbert's immortal romance, Naughty Marietta. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> the announcer has been Melville Lewis. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.